Welcome to Access Tribe. I'm chatting to Alana Mediavila today. She's a filmmaker and also a Bitcoiner. So she's going to be talking to us about her latest film, Dirty Coin, which is about proof of work and grid financing um, or Bitcoin mining, as others may know it. So I think this is going to be a really fascinating conversation. And it's very on point, given everything that's been going on in the mining space over the last year, especially with uh, the naysayers saying that it's bad for the environment and many environmentalists and Bitcoiners saying actually it's quite the opposite. So I'm really excited to get her views and her background on why she decided to make this documentary. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to you, Alana, to introduce yourself. Thank you so much for having me, Krista. Yes, <laughs> my name is Alana and I am producing the documentary Dirty Coin that it's about the controversy behind proof of work and the Bitcoin mining industry. And I'm very happy to be here to talk with you about it today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and um, also for allowing a complete stranger who stalked you across. I can't remember now if it was LinkedIn or or on uh, on Twitter <laughs> and name dropped neighbors of yours going, I've spoken to them. I'm not a crazy person. Can I interview you? <laughs> Anytime. Um, I appreciate it. Um, but I was kind of really interested to speak to you, I guess, for a number of reasons, really, is that, you know, I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole about a year and a half ago, and it's become, as it is, I think, for many of us, just a total obsession. And um, the mining topic has become really interesting to me because I just find it fascinating as a business because it's it, it has this word that has a connotation of being something very physical that's out in the middle of nowhere. You think of oil rigs and all of that kind of stuff. And then actually you discover that it's really data centers. And then there's the whole kind of environmental piece. There's all of that stuff that goes around it. And obviously there's been a lot of a kind of very concerted, I feel, kind of campaign over the last year to associate Bitcoin mining with environmental issues. So um, I thought it was fascinating that you were putting this film together. I saw that Peter McCormack has just gone out and been recording as well. So I was like, it's interesting that a lot of Bitcoiners are kind of very aggressively addressing this now. So um, you'd come up, I think, on my LinkedIn feed. You just kept appearing. So I think at some point I sent you a connection request. and was just like, I have to talk to this person. Um, but I wanted to get a bit of background before we delve into the Bitcoin piece, because I want to hear about how you got orange pilled. And it was interesting because you put on that on your Twitter thing, 2020 orange pilled me. So I want to hear that story. Um, but before we get to that, can you talk a little bit about how you got into filmmaking in the first place? Like what you like about it? Why did you do this as a career? Well, ever since I was little, I wanted to be a filmmaker, but I grew up in Puerto Rico and it, it, the, it, I never felt like I could do it here. Um, and then I moved to the States and it was just one of those professions that I felt like I couldn't really get in. It felt very daunting. Um, so I studied art. <laughs> I still studied something, you know, fine arts. Um, and I was in New York and I was there for 2008, 2009. Um, I had my daughter in 2008 over there and saw the financial crash. My husband's from California. So I moved to California because Silicon Valley seemed to be doing just fine when the rest of the world was kind of, right. it was hitting the fan. Um, and so I moved over to California and I started working for a video game company doing their illustrations, animations, a UI, um, their graphics. And we started producing their videos. I started producing their videos because we couldn't afford a production company to work with us. And I was like, I love it. Oh. I love I had all the Adobe suite on my computer and right. I had a good camera that I would, that I bought to take photos and videos of my daughter. And I was like, I can, I can do it. And I loved it. And I just did not want to stop editing, did not want to stop animating. I had started with animation and, and, you know, because I was working on the, um, the storyboards for the, for the video games that we were working on. And then I started doing storyboards for other com for other uh, commercials and films, and I was just honestly at the right place at the right time, and met a lot of people in the film industry in in NorCal, and started working more with them, uh, helping on set. I just wanted to be involved, you know. I it was something that I I never knew that I could do it myself, but I was like, hey, if you need an extra hand on set, I know how to carry bags, you know, I know how to plug things in, so just invite me and. And, and people did. And so I did that for a couple of years. And then I started my production company and started producing videos and commercials and social media content for right at the beginning of social media. Um, I was going to say that would have been, yeah, right around the iPhone era. 
Right. Yes. Yes, exactly. So, you know, everything was, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I was right in Silicon Valley. So I was, you know, going to their, their algorithm seminars and stuff so that you would know how to, how to do it right. And just produce marketing videos. And I've been, you know, I've been doing that for 12 years and, um, got recruited by Google and I was a filmmaker at Google cloud, which is why I have, um, my experience with data centers. Um, and, you know, continued recording films and customer stories from around the world, uh, diving really deep into machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, big data, data centers. And, and yeah, so that was like my, my, but I always really wanted to get into film. That was, that's that you, you don't, you're, when you're a kid, you're not necessarily like, I want to make marketing videos, you know, like you, <laughs> I, I wanted to make films and um, but I love tech and it was, I, I never had a bad day at the office. I always felt like this is so cool. And I loved the people that I was, that surrounded me. Um, and yeah. And, but now the dirty corn is really my, my first feature film. That's mine, mine. I've worked on other features for other people. And, but I felt like this is an opportunity for, you know, the videos that I've produced have been watched. I need to count how many millions of times, but many millions of times online. And they were, they had a big effect on uh, how how different communities saw the new data centers that were coming in. We would create pieces that would um, basically make people understand what it is that that Google was doing in the, these big big buildings. And we, I felt like I had a hand in in a lot of uh, uh, social media and and how that worked and mm. worked on a lot of that stuff and. So just to, I, I want to yeah. kind of like take a note just of that piece of the data centers, because I'll come back to that. But in the piece where you said about, I know you made a joke about nobody wants to like has an ambition of making marketing videos, but it would you have more naturally gone into making feature films if that had been open to you? And is it just an easier rung up to go in and do marketing videos? And would you perhaps recommend that for people who want to get into the space who just want to learn the technical skills? Great question. Um, in my case, I was a young mother and uh, a dropout. So I, and then I became a mother. All the best second. people are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so for me, putting food on the table was the priority number right. one. And I had friends that were doing film and they, it was like feast or famine and I could not handle famine. I had to make sure that it was always at least feast or food <laughs> always <laughs> had to be all had to be money um so marketing was a steady stream and i was really right. good at making videos that would go viral and um you know that kind of stuff for my clients so they just kept coming back and i just always felt like maybe i could use this for my stuff you know like this knowledge i can this marketing knowledge i can use it for you know my own products instead of somebody else's product but regarding your question in terms of uh in terms of if somebody were to be in my shoes i would say if you have access to work in film and you had you have access to do that, by all means, go in and do it. But um, at the same time, it really depends on what your priorities are. For me, the marketing videos were a great way of getting a lot of work done really, really quickly. So you yeah. get a lot of reps. It's not like one film for a year. It's, you know, and I, I was purporting and producing thousands of videos a year, the thousands. There was a, vid a year that we did like over 6,000 videos um, because we would chop them up for different platforms. We would, you know, oh, do, I see. Yeah. So you record one segment and then you use pieces of it for different content. Oh, that's interesting. Right. On the piece so on the data did, centers, like, then just to come back to that, because that's obviously a point. So, so just for context in the Bitcoin mining space, there's a lot of controversy around the energy use of Bitcoin miners, which are effectively data centers that churn out, you know, the, the mining process of Bitcoin, which we can go into. Um, <clears throat> I didn't realize that there had been any controversy about that with Google. Was that the case? I mean, and I presume the same thing would be with Amazon, with any large organization that has servers. Was this the case during the kind of cloud transition? You make a great question. So the cloud transition, there were other controversies that had to do with, you know, whether people wanted to put their, their customer sensitive information on their on-premise mm. servers versus on data, cloud data centers. So I was, I was working in the cloud industry when, when we were going through that transition of nobody's ever going to use the cloud to, yeah. you know, to today, which is kind of ubiquitous. Um, there were, there 
in terms of the electricity use, I don't believe that that was a big thing that people were concerned right. about. Okay. Um, but they were concerned about what is it, what does it mean? Um, you know, they had to also have the the cables. So there's just all of this infrastructure that had to go into putting a data center somewhere. Um, and there were there were just concerns over what is it like? What is this right. thing in the middle of farmland? Because it very often was kind of in the middle of farmland and they're not as noisy. They're not noisy actually, but, <laughs> but it's the, this huge, um, but they're, they're, they're just really, really big. So what is it? Is it a factory? How many people are going to be coming in and out? Are there going to be trucks? So we oh, had to really explain. Yeah. So it was more just a, a concern over what is, what is this big Google building coming? Cause it, and it's like extremely um, high security. So it's not really something that you can go and just kind of check out. So, we had to be able to to show what it was and at the same time show the high security to, for clients because clients needed to know or partners or whoever they needed to know how secure the data centers are. So, I yeah. So I, I wouldn't say that energy, at least we weren't really covering it that much in terms of the electricity consumption. It was more of what is it? What from from a physical perspective, what is that yeah. big thing that just moved into my town? Um, and from a security perspective, you know, it, how is it that Google makes sure that their data centers are secure? So obviously, there's probably a story going on around online somewhere about aliens being dissected in a Google data center somewhere. I'm sure. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like it's actually a cover for a CIA or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So we had to just you know just just explain what it was most of the time people jump to conclusions when they're not fully aware of yeah. all the facts and it's a matter of presenting the facts and letting people at the end of the day they're going to decide if that's worth it or not but at least they'll have more information what's the reason for data centers being in more remote locations is it just that the land is cheaper and you can just organize security better is there is there like a specific energy benefit for it well, I I wouldn't say that I'm the most qualified person to answer that question, Sorry. but from <laughs> you know, I, but from what I know, I can I can assume that it is because the land is cheaper, right. um, and they do need to have the security, and there's really no need to be in the middle of a city because they are very large locations. Um, yeah, so I would say that 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 that's probably a, a, a reason why, but it can't be too remote, so. It cannot, it needs to still be connected to, to, to the, the cabling. Yeah. Well, and to in very, very high speed internet cables as well, which is actually one of the differences between a Bitcoin data center, like a Bitcoin mining center versus, uh, you know, one of these cloud data centers, because they need to be able to access the information very quickly. And we're looking at videos, we're looking at hosting all of this content right. that customers need to be able to access. And where Bitcoin, you don't really, you don't need to have a connection to these high speed fiber cables or anything like that. So Bitcoin mining can be even more remote than, than um, these data centers that ultimately still need to be connected to, to the internet, to the worldwide yeah, internet. Yeah, that makes sense. So talk to me about your orange pill journey then, because you put on 2020 orange pilled me. Like, what was the process? Did you have any awareness of Bitcoin before you went down that rabbit hole? And what has happened since? <laughs> I did. I did. I've I I had awareness of Bitcoin since 2015. And it was just kind of an interesting thing of, you know, I'll invest in this and maybe it goes up. It wasn't really. Um, oh, so particular... you did actually like participate in the network. Back in 2015, you didn't just do what many of us did and go, that's interesting. Move on. <laughs> I did. I did. I mean, I, well done. I did. <laughs> I, I salute you. I, thank you. Well, you know, I did. I, I bought three whole Bitcoin, um, but... I, my husband was the one that used to handle our, our, our investments and everything. And I was the one that told him like, babe, we need to get this Bitcoin thing. Um, a good friend of mine that I trust, I still trust. He's still a very good friend. Um, he told me, Alana, as much money as you can waste in a weekend, put it into Bitcoin. And he was not the kind of pushy guy. He was never really pushy, um, but he made a lot of really good calls in the past. And I would tell him like, Hey, next time you have like a good opportunity, <laughs> just let me know. And so uh, he did, and my husband bought them. And and a few years later, when I see, saw that 
Bitcoin had reached 10,000. It was in the cover of a newspaper. I look at it and I'm like, oh my God, we have three of those. And you know, when we <laughs> bought them, they were 200 bucks. And I was just so imagine I was stoked. And <laughs> my husband was like, actually, I sold those. And I'm like, what? <laughs> he didn't even keep one. But he, oh you know, for, in his defense, it had gone down. It had gone up. We bought it on a website that looked like we really did lose our money. Um, it did uh, not look legit or anything at all. He wasn't even sure he was going to get his money out. So, so yes, I got into it, but, um, and your marriage survived. I, so this is a happy ending. <laughs> it, yeah. You know, it was my first experience of not your keys, not your crypto, you know, like I, I should have bought it myself. I should have figured it out myself. I should have been responsible for my own Bitcoin, which I am now. Um, but I wasn't <laughs> then, but in like around 2018, yeah, I would say a couple of years before 2020. Um, my family's Cuban. My mom is Cuban. My grandfather is Cuban. Oh, right. And he, he, I had posted something about Bitcoin on Facebook. And he, my grandfather, one day we were talking and he's like, oh, you know, your cousins that live in Spain, they send Bitcoin to, to his sister um, in Cuba. And they're using Bitcoin to send it between, mm -hmm. um, between like to get it into, to get the money into Cuba. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. I was like, really? Like you, interest, because for me, Bitcoin was just this, I, I would I would look at it. I would see that people were using it to buy drugs online or, or pizza or whatever, <laughs> like it, that it was really weird and fringe. And mostly I was just thinking of number go up. I wasn't really like orange pilled, right? I was, it was just this kind of, Thing that I wasn't really paying, I was paying attention to, but not, not in the same way. And so, but when he told me that it was a way of getting money into Cuba, I thought that was really interesting. And mm. I, and then that was it, but, but I didn't really think it would affect me because when you're an, an American and you're using the dollar, you really think you're on top of the world. And yeah. 2020. I think this is one of the things actually that I, I, I see people like Alex Gladstein, like Anita Posh get endlessly frustrated with with Westerners who don't understand how critical this is for human rights and for people who are escaping, you know, dangerous regimes or just have trouble accessing money or not having their money devalued by just unbelievable levels of inflation. I mean, everyone in the West is moaning about inflation now, but you look at places like Zimbabwe and Argentina and you're like, this is just a whole other level that we can't even comprehend, you know? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I was just in Argentina and I, if, while I was there, it was going up and up and up and the the prices for everything were were blocked out um because everything like they just can't moving even, target to, it's a moving target every day and i was seeing people at the markets just buying silver just like and just it, it was just the, the oddest feeling to see so many people just going just weighing the silver and just buying whatever even if it's a knife like they just wanted to like lock their money into something yeah into something sound um so for me, then 2020 came, rolled around and I realized that I, that I was a lot less untouchable as I thought I was and a lot less free than I thought that I was. Um, I was living in California when the lockdown happened and yeah. um, being in production, what that meant was I had, I, I go on shoots, I go on set and all of that went of away. Course. So uh, I had to, all of my shoots were grounded. Everything was paused and thankfully, I was able to transition to virtual events and virtual stuff. I was still working at Google at the time, and um, we were working on Google Next, which is Google Cloud's um, big conference. And we locked down days before the conference, just days. And we were able to transition and do it online. And um, word got around that I knew how to produce online uh, shows. And so I started doing that. So thankfully... I was able to transition, but a lot of my friends weren't as lucky. And um, I was just, I just saw how critical it is. And then I was working with people all over the world. So then I paying people and getting paid was also really tricky. And, yeah. and I'm like, being able to have a universal coin, but one that is not a, controlled by a central bank is what we need. And so, and we need to be able to, to send money back and forth and buy things that suddenly the government, um, like for example, ivermectin, you know, my, my neighbor, she used to take ivermectin for before COVID for other stuff. And suddenly she couldn't find it anymore. And suddenly she was afraid that if she were to buy 
like she would be tracked as like an anti-vaxxer or something as if, you know, and, and she started getting afraid wow. of buying medicine that she had been buying for a long time. Um, and then, you know, it gets slandered on TV as like a horse medication or whatever. And I just saw all of this happen in front of me and I'm like, we need something that we are not going to be traced with. We need, but at the same time, we need something global. Um, we need something digital. Uh, we need the equivalent of cash online. Yeah. And, and so, so yeah, so 2020 for me, and then that's when I really went down the rabbit hole of understanding Bitcoin. Um, and, but really not like really understand it. And it was, it was then that I was like, okay, this is it. This is what, this is this, this is what we need. Um, and this is the conversation that we need to be having of, of, you know, understanding our privacy online and, you know, what it means to translate our, the value of our work into something that people aren't going to be screwing with. Um, because we spend our lives working for money and so that somebody else devalues it because they want to change the world order or whatever. Like it's, it feels, it feels, it doesn't feel right. <laughs> it's it's so, yeah, actually so quite amazing. Thinking. Yeah, it's quite amazing, actually, because I feel like people don't understand what it is that happens to people when they start studying Bitcoin. Because when you start studying Bitcoin and understanding how this, I mean, for context, I worked in financial markets for 20 years and I got orange pilled in August 2021. I was like leaving, leaving the job that I was in in a bank. And I had a bunch of colleagues that had left and gone to the crypto industry. And I just thought, oh, you know what? I should kind of look into this a bit more because there's a lot of people transitioning into this industry. Like, what have I missed? And for context, I worked in corporate innovation. So I had a very good awareness, I thought, about Bitcoin and sort of understood blockchain technology and some of the applications for creating efficiencies. Like that was kind of my mindset. And somebody, it was actually my mum sent me randomly I told her, I was like, I, I want to just kind of look into this a bit more. And she sent me this Jordan Peterson video of him interviewing Robert Breedlove, uh, John Vallis, Richard James, the filmmaker, who I'm sure you know of. Um, he made the Bitcoin film that I forget the name of. And um, Gigi, I think it was uh, Gigi, the Gigi. Um, wow, that's an all-star. And, but yeah, but it was a very, I'll send you the link afterwards because it's, I mean, you would find it interesting even even having been orange pilled. But it was interesting because the reason that they had connected with Jordan Peterson was because they had a Bitcoin book club. And they felt that a lot of the stuff that the the themes that run through Bitcoin were very relatable to that book that Jordan Peterson had written called Maps of Meaning. So somehow they had got in touch with him and said, do you mind joining our book club? He happened to be interested in Bitcoin. So the, the way that the conversation was framed was kind of Jordan Peterson doesn't know much about Bitcoin and wants to understand why these guys think it relates to his book and talk about Bitcoin and understand it better. Anyway, this thing's about 90 minutes long. And at the end of it, it was like my entire world got shattered. I just sat there and I thought 20 years in financial markets and I have understood nothing about money. And so then what happened to me was what happens to everyone. You just go down this crazy thing because then I started listening to Robert Breedlove's podcast. The first series I listened to was the Jeff Booth series. So then I read uh, The Price of Tomorrow. And then it's just like you go through one thing and another. And you suddenly start to understand how unsound money just permeates through everything in society and everything becomes dysfunctional because you're not dealing in truth. If the money is manipulated and that's information, as Jeff Booth says, you know, it's information that you're transmitting. If the information is being manipulated, then you're not getting truth. And it's uh, it's quite wild, actually, when you start to understand how it permeates everything, you start questioning everything you've ever taken for, for granted. Um, so yes, it is quite fascinating that you had a somewhat similar experience in the sense that you were far more involved in Bitcoin than I was back then, but it took something that kind of shattered your illusions in some way of reality to, to tip you over that edge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but I want to talk to you then about the mining piece, because um, obviously you've been making movies or making films and, and, you know, sort of the general kind of videography you've then kind of gone, I guess, more down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, gone, this is super important. There are like a plethora of topics you could have covered in Bitcoin. Why did you get fascinated by mining? Okay, there are, there's already such great content about Bitcoin itself, like how Bitcoin mm. works, what is Bitcoin, why Bitcoin, all of that. 
And I would get often people saying like, well, I really like Bitcoin, but it's bad for the environment. Or I don't like how it's bad right. for the environment. And Bitcoin's great, but it's really bad for the environment. They should really move to proof of stake. And, you know, I, I just kept, I kept hearing this. And frankly, I didn't really know that much about Bitcoin. So here I was like, I didn't really know that much about, like you were saying, like economics, about a money and state, all of these different things. And then now I'm like, crap, I don't know about mining really. Like I knew the the the, the rudiments of it, just enough to know what, you know, what proof of work was. And, but I didn't really understand the industry. And so I started looking into it because I didn't want to support something, or at least I would like to know. It's like when yeah. you're drinking alcohol or smoking a cigarette. It's like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know? Like I wanted to know <laughs> if, if it was bad, then I wanted to at least know. I don't like to um, uh, like be in denial about things. I like to know everything about it. And, and it's even a, whatever you, you get the point, even if it's not great, I like to know everything about it. And so I, I actually went into finding out about mining very objectively, very, maybe it is bad for the environment, but let's look into it. And I started listening to podcasts that had to do specifically with mining. And then I started going down that rabbit hole. And, and then I realized that not only was it not bad for the environment, and I understood where that was coming from of just this idea of anything that uses electricity at all, then is bad, right? So you have to like, kind of go down to what's the, the first principles. Exactly. What is, exactly? Where where is this really coming from, and how is this built up on top of that? And um, and then I was just, I just felt like this was in a way Bitcoin's Achilles' heel. Not that I think it is, because then I kept looking and I'm like, this is Bitcoin's going to be fine. They're not going. This is not going to be a problem because. You know, if it's a problem over here, they just move over here or they move over there. There's always going to be a market yeah. for cheap energy. And I think they're going to be fine. But from the perspective of wanting to talk to my friends about it, I didn't want them to feel an adoption and people wanting to accept Bitcoin in their restaurants or their boutiques or, you know, really, I really feel that that piece of not understanding mining or thinking that mining is bad could prevent um, the, the, the rate of adoption. Yeah. Uh, at least around me. And and so I wanted to be able to do something about that because I feel like not only is is it not bad, it then I started seeing how it's helping finance grids in places that don't have access to reliable electricity. And that's when I was like, we got to talk about this because you can remove Bitcoin from, from the industry, like literally what they're doing. But and you just keep mining, which of course you can't remove them because then you wouldn't be mining. Or but <laughs> let's say you just remove what what my what Bitcoin is. When you have a miners paying for substations in South America and in Africa and all over the world, or improving the grid or consuming wasted electricity, which means that other that the people in the community can then pay less for their electricity. So for example, in the United States, you have grids that were built with factories in mind. Well, there's the, this factory is going to consume these many megawatts and this one's going to consume many megawatts. And suddenly you have all these factories leave and go to India or go to China or go to other places. Now you have that same grid with oh. only the people like now factories aren't there anymore consuming the electricity that that grid was created for. And, wow. you know, so they're not running as efficiently as they used to. They're not running at the profits that they used to. Now you have just the community bearing the weight of of of, of the grid, and and everywhere is different, right? Every like, literally everywhere is different. Different grids, different locations, different things. And some places they were still getting powered. Their grid was still being powered by dirty sources like coal and and other things. And so it again, this is it. That's why I'm making a whole documentary about it because it's it's not a it's not a black or white situation, but uh -huh. definitely one worth looking into. And in in the, my previous work, I did a lot of work about the digital divide and how it is that people that don't have access to the internet um, just are not going to have the same advantages as somebody that does have access to, to the internet. Um, and we can 100% see that, especially in 2020, when people were locked in their houses, the people that were able to work from home, study from yeah. home, those people were not as affected by the lockdown as people that could not go to work because they had to physically go there or they had to physically go to school. Yeah. Um, 
But when we look at the digital divide, I had never really thought about the access to electricity divide. And there's a lot of people that, yes, I want them to have access to the internet or at least have the choice. I'm not saying that necessarily that's the best to move into the the direction that we're moving into. (laughs) Imagine the bliss of being disconnected from the internet. Ah, Exactly. (laughs) But you know, but I, I I believe that people should have the choice if they want to be connected or not connected. That's up to yeah. them, but they should at least have the choice. But here I was, the Silicon Valley, you know, millennial thinking like, oh, my God, some people don't have access to electricity and or Internet. And but then for so much longer, so many people haven't had access to electricity. And yeah. that's even more important because that's how you get your refrigerators and your, you know, life saving uh, machines. And uh, I was going to say, I'm guessing you've, you've probably read Alex Epstein's book, Fossil Future, right? I'm guessing. I have not, but I have seen oh, you have many not? of his. Uh, I have not yet. I It is on my to yeah. read list. And I have seen several of his. Um, I have seen him online many, many times. So, right. So I'm well, it's funny because I, with his perspective. My, my kind of interest in Bitcoin mining led me to try and look. I, I really, to be honest with you, the whole environmental thing and climate change, global warming, blah, blah, whatever label you want to give it. I had always just accepted the science as given. And I'll be honest, I just didn't really have bandwidth to look into it, nor a deep interest in the technicalities about the numbers. But I got interested in Bitcoin mining and I wasn't quite as as kind of, uh, you know, I didn't have the sort of uh, environmental concerns quite as front of mind. But a Bitcoin miner that I know through through the Bitcoin community had posted a thing to Alex Epstein's Fossil Future book. And I'd been looking for something that had a counter narrative because you get so much of the, oh, the world's going to collapse in 10 years. We're all going to be dead and New York will be underwater. And I was like, 10 years rolls along and you're like. It does. Yeah. (laughs) But but I mean, that aside, I was kind of like, what's the counter narrative? Because if there's ever something, surely there's somebody else debating the other side of it. There always has to be. And it was the first time I'd really come across anything. And so I actually listened to Fossil Future. I think it was sometime around mid-October last year. So very, very recently. And then it just so happened that where I live, Alex Epstein was coming to do a talk. So just randomly out of left field, I'd actually met him and saw him live, I think about two, three weeks after I finished reading the book, which was just like the weirdest thing. Um, So that was great. But the book was really interesting for that because he talked exactly about that, about the the humanitarian impact of not having electricity. And candidly, similar to you, I had never really considered that. I never thought about the fact that, you know, there are life saving medical treatments in hospitals that you can't have because you don't have electricity. You know, infant right. mortality is higher. People freeze to death. They, you know, boil to death, so to speak. Um I was just kind of like, oh, nobody really talks about this stuff, actually, and about how important it is to make sure that everybody has access to electricity. And then you layer on that this very weird, like, misinformation that goes around about nuclear energy, which is extremely strange. I have a friend who did insurance for about 40 years in the nuclear industry, and he's also a massive environmentalist. He's retired now, but he's absolutely furious about it because he said it's the only way that you reduce carbon in the environment and have clean energy. And by the way, this is the reality of what nuclear looks like and how safe and clean it is. So I just find that whole topic actually very fascinating. It's interesting that you've you've clocked the humanitarian piece. Yes. Well, for me, it is really important. My my son is going to say hi and bye. Mira, this is my <laughs> little boy, Lucas. <laughs> Hello, Luca. Um, <laughs> and I will say that my kids are one of the reasons why I wanted to clarify. Um, I think he's a uh, permanent fixture now. <laughs> I think he's good at yeah. Uh, he, they're they're an important part at, for for me because they can't. You can't be raised in a world where you think that 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 the world is going to end in the way that it that that it's right. being sold to us. And okay, I love you, but you're too distracting. Okay, go with that. <laughs> I'm not telling you when I'm done. Okay. <laughs> the yellow car. I'll give it to you in a little bit. It's over there. Te amo. Sorry about that. Um. <laughs> First of all, I'm very, I'm a big fan of, of nuclear, and I keep, all I right. keep thinking I'm gonna produce a, a documentary about nuclear, and I'm gonna call it Kaboom, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <Because> <laughs> going kind of along the lines with Dirty Coin. Um, we, 
it's important to be able to have these debates. And having lived in California for so long, and especially Silicon Valley, it's it's so bizarre to see everybody agree on everything so, and it's just just accepting it. And I was raised to to debate and to, mm. to 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 question things. And this feeling of just fully accepting this truth when it, how is it true and how do we know that it's true? And it's so and when then and then, you know, my husband worked for Volkswagen and they were, you know, talking about all of the electrical cars and everything. And we were looking into lithium and just some of and then I'm like, well, electric cars aren't as green as we think. And especially and just this whole greenwashing. And yeah. there's so much well, information. The, the mining, the mining of the cobalt for lithium. I mean, I, I get so mining, enraged. right? <laughs> I know. I mean, I get enraged now because I, I watched that uh, Joe Rogan podcast that he did with that that guy that's actually visited all of the. I mean, it's just shocking. And then you see people cheerleading yeah. free Vs. And and again, this friend of mine, actually, I spoke to him about that. And I said, what do you think about it? Leaving aside the humanitarian issue of the kids mining the cobalt. Um, but he said, well, the only context in his mind, in an environmental context where an EV makes sense is to have clean air in cities. But he said in terms of the production and the running of them, there's, there's just somewhat nonsense that it's a, a green solution. So if you're looking at the respiratory aspect in the middle of a city, absolutely. You know, you don't want to be in Manhattan. And wouldn't it be great if all the vehicles were electric? But that was his take. I don't know if you you would agree. Well, I, what I would say about that is it's kind of like saying I see I see that. But it's like saying, well, I don't want any factories in my country that employ children or slaves, but I will buy goods that are made yeah. in a from a factory that have children and slaves, but in a different country. So that doesn't affect me. But you're no. still a part of that and you're still a part of that economy. And to then claim that you are humanitarian because you kicked out all the bad factories from your country or your state and you know you ah, so wonderful but let's go and shop for everything that we buy from locations where that is exactly the type of people that are being employed or not even employed that are being forced yeah. to work it's base it's 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 really for me it's uh we have a saying tapar el cielo con las manos it's uh concealing the sky with a hand you know like you you're just you're just being you're you're not accepting that you're still very much it's still very much there it's still very much a problem right. so i mean i don't it's not necessarily the the cross that i want to die on um yet <laughs> we'll see in the future <laughs> but because you know at the end of the day i do believe that um electric vehicles have have a you know their pros their cons um you know, that's a completely different subject. But for me, one of the reasons why and and I knew that I wanted to do a documentary that was going to kind of uh, challenge the the everybody knows of something like I really wanted to do that because I have really smart friends and I know very smart people that have just kind of accepted a lot of realities yeah. and you know, all of mainstream media just continues to accept certain realities. And I knew that I wanted to challenge that in a way that made us kind of want to challenge everything um and typical me, bitcoiner it, don't trust verify yeah. don't trust exactly <laughs> exactly um and so for me bitcoin was a more important issue there's a lot of issues in the world i live in puerto rico there are issues here there's issues in the united states there's issues with women there's issues there's issues everywhere but i believe that if we can solve um, the issues that Bitcoin solves, it just kind of then we start with a better base for everything else to then kind of be handled on top of that. And when I saw that Bitcoin mining in that industry is, you know, helping do everything I said, they just balance the grid, uh, re reinforce the grid, create new new grids. Um, that is or decentralize the grid as well decentralize the can, power can you production. explain for for non-power producers because I, I i kept seeing this quoted and it was immensely frustrating to me initially to understand what people meant because you'd see people say this is all rubbish bitcoin helps stabilize the grid can you explain what that actually means for people and why that's needed so pe people don't always can like okay Let's let's this is an example that I like to give. Imagine that you have 
a store, like a, like a Costco size. And you need to build a store for the biggest amount of consumption that your store will ever get. Let, like, let's say a Black Friday. Black Friday, everybody comes and everybody uh, consumes. So you need to build a store that can, that can, give you the, the 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 everything that you need like the resources that 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 day needs right we have those peak days in electricity we have them a couple in the summer a couple in the winter where that is where everybody comes home and they need everybody puts on the heater everybody puts on the ac the grid needs to be as big as its biggest consumption it needs to be able to produce that it doesn't grow it needs to be able to pr- be that Costco that lets everybody in. But the rest of the year or maybe the rest of the day, you could survive with a bodega size store because you only have like a few people coming in and out to buy. So, but now you have all this wasted space, all this wasted infrastructure that nobody's really consuming, but you need to have it because you need to be ready for those moments where everybody's going to come in. I have a cat trying to get on my lap. (laughs) I have a side issue. (laughs) That's awesome. Just, uh, this is, you know, recording from home. This is what it is. Um, and, and just for and context, so, that's an issue because the grids can't store the power, the, the excess that they generate. Is that correct? Correct. The, the, it's just cont- continuously going. It's either used or it's wasted. And if it's not used, then it's wasted. But you're still paying for the full infrastructure of 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 the grid. You know, you're still paying for all of that. So, and it does mean that sometimes it suddenly needs to boot up because everybody comes home at the same time or whatever. And then it just has to, you know, boot up. And, and again, this is something that I've interviewed way more qualified people for the documentary than, than me. Um, so I'm explaining it based on what smarter people than me in this area have said, but imagine then having being that Costco store size store. And when all of your customers leave, you can then stay, call up Bitcoin and be like, hey, can you come and consume and fill up those gaps that while nobody is consuming? And then when all those people come, you're going to boot down. Now, Mm. they don't just Bitcoin miners don't just do this out of the goodness of their heart. Like, oh, I'm just going to leave in those moments of higher consumption. the, The cost of the electricity also goes up because. Right you know, those, that, those are peak hours. So the cost goes up. So the miners sometimes are turning off even without the utilities telling them to, to, to turn off. They don't want to have to spend, you know, the, the, the financials might not make sense for them. Again, depends on where they are. This is extremely individual depending on where you are, but in terms of balancing the grid, what it is doing is you now have a consumer that can come in and consume the electricity that nobody else wants to consume. Yeah. And then they could boot down when, when people need it, when the hospitals needed, when whatever is needed. And they can boot down in a matter of seconds, if not a second or fraction of a second. But we're looking yeah. at really, really short. This this kind of demand generation is um is not new. This is something that used to happen before uh, when it was a very, very cold time. Maybe they would call up a car factory or something and they would say, <laughs> hey, can you to please acquiesce <laughs> to the cat? Bring her in. <laughs> It's like a panther. My God, so big. Oh, no, he's, he's very old. He's actually 22 years old, Thomas. Um, He's got a duff I... eye. Look at him. He's just... <laughs> oh, he's Somehow he's still soldiering on. <laughs> but he does he look has like a, a good panther. life. He does. He's gorgeous. <laughs> so, yeah, so miners then come in and they can fill in those gaps where electricity is at, at its cheapest and you know and imagine being able to now put yourself in the in the in the point of view of a utility that is now able to be a lot more profitable because all of this electricity that they were just grounding or wasting they are now monetizing so they are now much more profitable a company at the end of the day it, mm. It is a company. So they are now, they now have a buyer of electricity that's going to buy the electricity that nobody wants in the locations that nobody wants. So let's say, for example, they are think, uh, you know, a particular city or, or a, a state or a country is thinking, okay, we would like to be able to expand um, and create a new town over here or a new city over here, or we would like to start moving over to renewables and we want to build out a ton of solar um, or wind or whatever. 
that's expensive. And so, and it's not going to be profitable yet because people don't live there yet, or you don't have a factory there yet. You can put a Bitcoin miner there and that my, that area is immediately profitable because it is selling the electricity to the miner that does not need to produce an entire factory, right? They don't need to, like a Tesla, a, a gigafactory, it requires a couple of years to build. A, you just put a few Bitcoin mining containers and they just, they just suck up all that electricity and they're able to monetize that. And let's say it's time for for the for the factories to come in or for whoever else to come in from a from a social planning perspective, those miners can now move to the next location that nobody right. else wants the electricity or or there's nobody there to consume it. And they can then go and have that be profitable again. So the way that that works is so interesting and fascinating because it that's where then people say that the amount of electricity that bitcoin consumes is a feature and not a bug because yeah there's no other industry that can do that like i said data centers a the infrastructure is they're not on containers you know they're 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 big and you have to build it out and it needs to be close to the internet and you can't just like move it every six months yet these a lot of these miners are in not all of them again is a decentralized network. Everybody does however they want to do it. But <laughs> a lot of them are in these containers and they can just easily move around um, where where they're needed. So it's a really interesting, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that whole thing about the stranded methane, I mean, I learned about that through Bitcoin, that when oil is produced or dug from the ground, you get this methane that just gets burnt off. And actually the Bitcoin miners are like, excellent free energy. I'm just going to come there, capture it, keep the atmosphere cleaner, and drive my Bitcoin miners. I mean, it's really nuts, the application. I was at a meetup last week, and it was actually really fascinating. I think I sent you an email about it as well, but there's a really fascinating panel on mining, and they had experts there on immersion uh, cooling, and they were talking about how this is basically the future of data centers, but also the future of heating buildings, because you can put a Bitcoin miner in something that is not baby oil, but is similar to baby oil in its consistency, I believe. So very clear, it's not baby oil, but, but similar. Do not put your Bitcoin miner in baby oil. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but you can heat your whole house through this in a very efficient way. Um, so I just thought that that was really fascinating because I thought, gosh, like, you know, we're just going to dispense with, you know, furnace heaters, with boilers, with with all of these things and have a very different look and feel, I guess, to uh, energy in the future. Um, I wanted yeah. to talk to you about the process of making a film as well, then, because I'm not a filmmaker and I find it really fascinating talking to people who do jobs that I haven't had a lot of exposure to. So when you came to this decision, what the heck happens then? Because you've got to go get funding. You've got to figure out who you're going to talk to. You have to structure the documentary in some way and then do the whole filming. So like, what does that whole process look like and how long does it take from start to end? Or do you not know yet? <laughs> well, um, I, that's a funny question. I hopefully do know because I have a, a timeline that I want to stick to. Um, I believe that the, it's, it's important to go over this now, um, before it gets a little too out of control. It's still confusing to people. Um, and frankly, the opposition to Bitcoin mining, they're not doing a great job. Even all they say is bad for the environment. When you look at Greenpeace and you look at their, their, their Twitter is just like, you guys need to change the code. It's so bad. And I'm like, come on, do better. <laughs> you know, like really do better yeah. bashing, bashing the industry. But anyway, they don't. Um, so it's interesting because I was not a Bitcoiner in the Bitcoin uh, community. I was just kind of like a Bitcoiner on my own. You know, I'm not really wanting to engage when I moved to Puerto Rico um, I, there was a big crypto community and there were like the Bitcoiners and the crypto people and the Bitcoiners tend to not go to all the meetups because they're just tired of going to listen to rug pool <laughs> pitches all the time. And especially in 2021. Um, and so didn't really get to meet a lot of Bitcoiners and I got to see a lot of people in crypto and I was like, yeah, I mean, I just, just, just leave me with my Bitcoin. I wasn't on Twitter. So I was, I didn't. I was in that whole like crypto is in Bitcoin or Bitcoin is in crypto that I know now. Um, but when I started, I just saw I just saw it as like, eh, just leave me alone. I'm not really into crypto. I'm just kind of 
into Bitcoin, you know, and I, I actually tried very hard to get interested in crypto because I was like, am I missing something? Everybody seems really excited about this. And my impression coming from a financial markets background was that it looked very like the fiat system. I couldn't understand why everybody was excited. And the only phrase I kept hearing was Turing complete. Blockchain. And I was just kind of like, well, yeah, blockchain. But I'd hear like Turing complete because I, I asked a lot of people and I interviewed actually for a podcast series. I was I was doing some uh, pro bono work, events organizing for a Bitcoin company. Company in in Toronto, and so I did a, a, a interview series of like female women in crypto, and it was really interesting. And I talked to some like amazing women in the crypto space building amazing products. Um, and some of the rationale was very uh, interesting. But I did ask everybody this sort of question, like why why sort of are you interested in like the Ethereum space? And generally, the the answer I would get would be like it's Turing complete, so it's a lot more flexible. You can do a lot more things. But I kind of look at that having worked in finance and been in financial markets when the 2008 crash happened. And I'm kind of like, yeah, when you do all this stuff like staking and layering complexity into things and like building stuff that is just you know, almost like rehypothecation of things going all the way around. I mean, there's lots of issues around that. You kind of build this sort of house of cards that it's not like if it will come down, it's when it will come down. And all yeah. of the benefits of Bitcoin just seemed completely missing from there, like the decentralization, um, you know, like the security of the network, the fact that, you know, it's, it, it is essentially sound money and it has all of those benefits. It can't be inflated in, in terms of its issuance schedule, you know, beyond beyond what's hard coded in. So that certainty that you have was just completely missing from all of these things. And I just found it very difficult to get excited about it, to be honest. I was just kind of like, I don't I don't really get like why everyone's passionate about this. And I often read that people go, Bitcoin's a bit boring. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I I think it's very solid is how I would describe it as opposed to boring is you, you kind of know what you're dealing with. And it has really interesting applications. Um, that's sort of my take. I don't know. They should go to one of the Bitcoin conferences and then <laughs> say that again. <laughs> it's boring because there's so much stuff that's occurring. And then when you look at the Lightning Network and you look at you oh know, God, everything yeah. else that's happening, there's, I, I, I find it obvious. Obviously, we find it fascinating. We would never yeah. say it's boring. <laughs> but when I started, um, when I decided to produce a documentary about it, um, it was, and I'm not a miner. I didn't know any miners. It was just really more me, uh, coming coming from a pro energy perspective, pro Bitcoin perspective, mm -hmm. but at the same time acknowledging that people had already kind of made up their mind about it. They had already kind yeah. of thought like, okay, Bitcoin is good, but, you know, or Bitcoin is not good, but, or, oh yeah, I've heard about Bitcoin. It's bad for the environment. So there was already this um, idea that had been placed in people's heads that Bitcoin is a dirty coin. And I want, that is exactly what I wanted to address. So I call the film Dirty Coin. It's clickbaity. It's marketing -y. It's all the things you need it to be for people to click on it and watch it. And But going into the space and telling miners that I'm producing a documentary on Bitcoin mining and I'm calling it Dirty Coin, you can only imagine if everybody was like, wow, you know? And so, and it, and it was a little tough at the beginning because um, Bitcoiners, as they should be, they're very private, they're very, they're, they're really trust people um and again i say i say they but it's everybody's different um and so at the beginning it was really about me establishing how opening these doors opening mm. giving myself access to be able to um i didn't want it to be a voiceover documentary where it's just me talking for an hour and a half and then just putting images that support i really wanted to interview people in the space and i wanted to um, really get them to defend the industry and to not just defend, but just state the facts of what's occurring in the industry. And so the first few months was really about knowing, am I going to get access? Because if you don't have access and you're creating a documentary, um, you're going to have a really hard time. And I, and I have produced documentaries like that before where I didn't really have access to the, to the top people in the space. And then it just ends up being kind of weak. So at the beginning, it was about, you know, raising some funds, finding some people. I kind of saw what I was doing. And there are other documentaries for about Bitcoin mining, and there's a lot of information online. But I wanted to create something for a very particular person in my mind, which is, a, you know, a coastal liberal, you know, a liberal mm. from New York City or from San Francisco or from Portland, you know, Toronto, you know, people that they're they're smart. They are into tech. They like tech. 
they would be a Bitcoiner probably if they knew a little bit more about it, but mm. they believe that it's bad for the environment. They're very um, environment conscious and I'm with you, I think, on how we feel about, you know, a global warming and all of that. But I do believe that when people that are very upset by it, I have a few friends that they don't even want to have children because they don't want oh, to contribute gosh. to global warming. And but but that comes from such a good place, right? They want to save the world for I guess for my kids, because I I had three. Um <laughs> and they that that is something that I wanted to create a film for them for somebody that doesn't really understand what Bitcoin is. And I wanted to go extremely mainstream with it. Um, and, and so that's, that's where the branding came in or it is still coming in. And I was just at Sundance. I just got back last night and there were two you films said. that had to do with mining. And, oh. you know, when people are asking me like, what, what, but mining, like real mining, not, well, you know. Oh, I see. Right. Physical <laughs> mining. Um, and when I said I'm I'm producing a documentary on Bitcoin mining, everybody was really interested, which was such a good um, a place for me to be because these people aren't going to go on YouTube and, yeah. and like look up Bitcoin mining, right? That that's not for them. That's for, for more down the rabbit hole. In fact, they can watch my movie and then they can go and watch all the other great ones that are out there, like this Machine Greens and a, a bunch of great uh, uh, resources that are out there. But mine is a lot more top of the funnel of, I think I've kind of heard of it. I'll give it, oh, it's 75 minutes. Yeah, cool. I'll watch it for 75 minutes. And then I'll know a little bit more about this. Um, And so, and then reaching out to people and saying, can I interview you? And them trusting me that I'm not going to twist it and rug pull them and suddenly yeah. make them say something crazy. And then, you know, once you get a few ins, you then more doors start people opening. People introduce and, you. And I wouldn't, I would say that it wasn't until November um, that I felt like I made it, like I'm in, I'm in, I know all the people in the space, people know what I'm doing, and now we can work on this together, because it really is about a lot of different people are um, attacking this problem from different angles, um, and, and now I feel like we really have this community effort to look at, okay, well then, who are we interviewing? What are what this is? This is the my storyline. My storyline hasn't actually changed much since I set out to create the film. I was going to ask very, you clear... that actually, if the storyline changes as you meet people, because that's that was one thing I was curious about whether you were able to stick fairly rigidly to your initial intent, or if it just goes completely left field because you talk to somebody and it just changes everything. No, it it didn't because I knew I, I knew the the story arc of of you know, what I'm going, there are some areas that I'm expanding more on, um, that I didn't think like methane mitigation, for example, I just thought that we were going to quickly talk about it, but, um, now we may spend a little bit more time talking about methane okay. mitigation, especially because, you know, methane, um, and don't quote me on this number because I've ha actually heard a few different numbers and I don't know why there's a few different numbers, but it, methane is, Many more times. How about this? I won't say a number. Many more times, a more of a greenhouse gas than carbon di than carbon dioxide. And when you uh, flare that, it's way worse for for the mm. for the warming effect on the planet than than you know cars, for example. So to be able to have miners come in, and not to mention that it's also a cost center for these oil companies. So they right. have to pay to 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 flare it properly and if they're not doing it properly they get fined um and so to be able to monetize that imagine having a business where you have to pay to get rid of something and now somebody wants to buy it from you it's it's a win-win situation because the miners come in they some of them they'll do the entire thing they'll do the entire infrastructure like building the the actual generator that grabs the methane so they're coming in they're like i hmm. just want your methane and we'll 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 take it from there. Can you just sell me your methane, and we'll put wow. in the machines that are necessary to turn it into electricity, and we'll you know turn it into Bitcoin, and we're just going to pay you for it. And I can will only you, imagine. Will you, how... will you cover the look and feel of that in your documentary, like so people can actually see visually what it looks like for somebody to construct one of these things and put it in, and where they're tapping into it, and that kind of stuff. You will. yes, yes, and that's where animations come in with the film because there's a lot uh -huh. that that I I love creating animations when it comes to tech stuff. Oh, really? 
Yeah, because not all of us can understand, and you know, my yeah. background's in animation, so I I prefer to be able to not not everybody but everybody can be conceptual to to be told mm. something technical and then kind of piece it together and i am 100 percent one of those people i need to draw it out i need to see i don't care if it's a stick figure i need to be able to like see it so that i can understand yeah. how it works and and yeah so methane is definitely something that i believe is it's it's one of the game changing um uh, things that bitcoin can do because again you can put it anywhere where, and I believe that this is going to be transferable to other uses of data centers. And this is the part where um, it gets interesting because or it's always been interesting, but when it comes to this, this feeling of like, well, we can't Bitcoin mining, we're going to, there's a moratorium or it's illegal. We're not going to do it. You're, you're deciding who gets electricity and who doesn't get electricity yeah. based on whether you like them or not. But really you know, are we are we measuring how much electricity the porn industry takes up? I mean, or I don't, why why was that the example that sprung into my mind? <laughs> right. I mean, that's a that's also a lot of videos that are constantly being put up there and watched, and th that's in a data center somewhere, and that's consuming a lot of electricity. And yeah. are we going to now start moralizing the use of electricity because you a you don't you like or you don't like Bitcoin or you like or you don't like this website? And as we move forward, AI and all of the stuff like chat GPT, where's that running? That's running on a data center somewhere. Are we going to then start saying, well, this AI is, is okay. And this AI is not okay. And, and again, I think we are, I think that we are going to get into a place I, I just, where. This is one of the things that I find really fascinating about all of these kind of um, call them sort of oppressive control measures is what they do increasingly is they drive decentralization because at some point, the kind of bureaucratic burden of this sort of infrastructure just becomes too much. And so the only option is for people just to move to a more decentralized thing. I mean, it was funny, actually, I saw another filmmaker, actually, who probably, you know, but was tweeting this morning about he had posted, he has like an auto tweet function where it posts automatically to LinkedIn. And he had posted something that the rep of a company who shall remain nameless had said publicly and, or had said, sorry, I shouldn't say publicly, but had said and was recorded saying, and LinkedIn removed it like from his post. And he was just like, what the heck? But this is the videos out there. Like, it's not, you know, I'm just posting something and I've posted it to Twitter equally here. And it kind of got me thinking that there's this whole thing where it's like suddenly you, OK, so, you know, what do you use LinkedIn for, for professional connections for this and that? So now, OK, you need an alternative to that because it's beginning to become dysfunctional. And as it becomes more dysfunctional, people need an alternative option. Well, now we've got the NOSTA protocol. So, you know, the social media community is I think it's one of those things where I wouldn't even say it slowly anymore. I see so many stories posted about NOSTA and instructions on how to onboard and the development on there is going on so rapidly that people are shifting there. So, you know, I, I think I added the NOSTA uh, developers on a response to this guy's thing and said, you know, you really need to start looking at building an equivalent for LinkedIn because people need to be able to port their their professional networks with them as well as they move from platform to platform. Um, so it's yeah. interesting because what was going, going through my mind when you were talking about that data center usage, does it start to become that people just go gridless themselves? Like they just say, right, I'm going to have to produce my own energy because the the grid is becoming so political that I can no longer mm -hmm. rely on being able to get energy uh, or or I God forbid I get my energy get censored because somebody doesn't like what I say I mean you know this is what we're seeing with finance right financial censorship is really what drove the creation of Bitcoin ultimately I think or it was one of the the, the huge factors so it's just interesting to me that it's almost kind of like the more this sort of uh, um governing infrastructure if you like grapples with trying to micromanage how people live their lives and what they are and aren't allowed to do the more it drives the need for this decentralization and a shift towards it yeah a hundred percent i i think it's fascinating how we are moving more towards full sovereignty you know mm. we we have an option we have a choice and you know walmart didn't kill the small business people shopping at walmart killed the small business yeah and you know we we have an opportunity to i completely agree with i mean being able to produce your own electricity this is now feasible you know back in the day we couldn't like we had to depend mm -hmm. on 
the mommy state, you know, daddy state to take care of us, to, to educate us, to give us access to money, to give us access to so many things we needed to go through the state. And we don't really have to anymore. And, Mm -hmm. but what's, what occurs is that I've noticed that not everybody wants to take control over their lives. They do (laughs) want to be taken care of and they do want the, the, the nanny state to, to tell us what's good and what's bad and what we should do and what we shouldn't do and what we should know and not know. And was it, was it Benjamin Franklin who said like those who trade freedom for safety deserve neither? Was it Benjamin Franklin? I, I remember reading that, that quote recently. That one. Yeah. Those who would trade their freedom. For, I think the quote, I might be getting this completely wrong, but those who would trade their freedom for safety for a little bit of safety deserve neither. Yeah. It's kind of nuts. Yeah. And that's what we've been doing for so long. It's like, please protect us. Please do this. Please do that. And then we just give all the control over to the government. And I think that we've gotten to, or, or what I feel is that we've gotten to a place where we want that control back. And yeah. I wasn't there when that control was given and you it's tough to say you know what I would have done at that moment um but I am definitely of the generation that's like let's take that control back and let's see what we can do as a community as a decentralized community um as a person that has moved around I have no problem kind of moving to a place that has more like-minded people it's creating their own electricity growing their own eggs you know their own their own meat and vegetables and I love it because I believe that we're moving forward into the future, but backwards into so many um, more traditional ways of life. Yeah. And more traditional ways of life. It's really interesting, actually. Lynn Alden had posted a a thing on Twitter. I want to say it was yesterday. And and she, she always like poses these really fascinating questions. But she had said, what is the book that you have read that you would you completely disagree with, but you would recommend anybody read and a couple uh-huh. of people actually in the thread it's a really interesting thread actually if you go and pick it up because there's lots of books in there like a lot of people quoted like Karl Marx's works and things like that and said you know you should read them but one of the things was the Unabomber's manifesto I, I very sketchily vaguely know what the Unabomber was but I've never paid any attention to it but when you go and read his manifesto it's like frighteningly rational because you sort of read about this mm. whole thing about the impacts of technology but I put a comment on it and responded and said I wonder what he would make of Bitcoin because he was so against technology and yet many of the things that he said technology was destroying Bitcoin is actually restoring you know like more traditional wow. values like self-sufficiency like yeah and it's it was just actually really interesting to read it from a Bitcoin mindset mindset context because I thought I can kind of see where he is going with this I mean he was talking about the issues of like you know mental health problems that people have had because of hyper connected world and you know the impacts of technology all this kind of stuff and I thought yeah it's interesting because when you look at the Bitcoin community it's very much about like doing your own food production being self-sufficient you know like uh, yeah being autonomous kind of not relying on on state to to kind of nanny and do stuff for you it was interesting the piece you mentioned as well about the giving the control over because I think the reason people give control over is they trade it for safety. So it's, you know, I the contract is you you do these things better than I could do them for myself. But I think people now are starting to look at their governments racing towards like World War Three with a nuclear power and going, hang on a minute. You've not only got my con- you have failed to get my consent for that because you didn't tax me for engagement in that in that kind of military activity. You've basically done it through money printing. So at no point in the ballot box did I give get a say as to whether, you know, my wealth could be spent on this. But you're also putting right. the entire world at risk of a nuclear war that you're fighting by proxy, really, you know, which is kind of nuts. And the fact yes. that people are so accepting about it is just it is just wild that that kind of mindset of like oh well yeah it's fine this is what we should be doing I'm like no you know and even if you think that's what you should be doing you have no right to drag the entire rest of the world's population into something where their lives are put at risk because you have a belief that something should or shouldn't go a certain way and certainly not to charge them for the pleasure through inflation and money printing you know which is nuts really I mean it's kind of nuts when you think about it so yeah um, I'm just conscious of time because I think we've gone over and I could talk to you about this stuff for hours. But um, I wanted to ask you a couple of things then, because I know that you're raising through Geyser. So you're doing some crowdfunding. So could you tell yes. people how they can support your project through that and where they can find you? Yes, thank you. So Geyser, it's like a it's like a Kickstarter for Bitcoin. It's the, the easiest way to say it. <laughs> and 
I I love it. I believe that it's it's such a great way for Bitcoin creators to like we're we're not launching NFT projects. <laughs> you know, we're not <laughs> we're not doing that stuff. Maybe some of us, and that's you know, to each their own. But I'm not. I didn't want to deal with that. I looked into stacks a little bit, but I just felt like I didn't really have the bandwidth to also then launch like this whole Bitcoin project or you know NFT project. Um, and so Geyser was just such a great way. BTC Pay also has a crowdfunding feature that you can, you know, add to your node. So that's also really cool. But Geyser creates this creator community that they really support. And I really love that. And put up my project on Geyser. I also received a grant from Geyser last year. Nice. Um, yeah. And so if anybody wants to send me some stats, that would be awesome. I am you know, using the sats, I, I I raised some money in August. And with that, I was able to go to um, Amsterdam and record in Amsterdam. So I got six interviews, thanks to the, the, the funds that I was able to raise. The majority of the film is really, I'm raising funds privately for that, because it's, it's, you know, it's a lot more money. But the, there's a few different uh, perks that people can get if they donate through Geyser. So I definitely, anybody that would like to send me some stats, that would be awesome. But also look into having your own Geyser campaign and and seeing what you can put up out there because it could totally function as well as a, um, what's that? Oh, now, I've, of course, the second I want to say the word, I forget. Patreon, it's also like a Patreon. So right. if somebody has, you know, a podcast or something that they want to do for Bitcoin, um, they can put it up there and then their community can support them directly. And it goes straight into your lightning wallet that Geyser doesn't keep uh, any funds or anything. It goes, they just enable the website that, that, that enables that peer to peer transaction. So I love what they've been able to do. And I love the support that I've received from them as well. Like I can text them at, at any time when I had issues and, or, or I didn't understand how to do something and they would either fix their issue on their end or they would tell me how to do it. So they're very, very helpful and we need to be able to have um, new tools like this. And Geyser is just one of them. And I would love for people to follow us on Twitter. And that's where we're going to start a new series called uh, Minor Site Chat. And we're going to have, you know, miners coming on and talking about different subjects and oh, just nice. really creating a community. Yeah, because we, uh, the film, I can only go over so many things, you know, like, for example, we just had a conversation that's probably going to be the length of the film, right? It's 75, around 75 minutes. So we're not, and we're not going to be able to get into everything in the film, but I want people to, that are interested in the subject to, to be able to dive deeper into certain, into certain areas yeah. and, and really give people the opportunity to, to continue doing their own research on the subject that's great and actually because the the only kind of educational thing I did actually ask some bitcoin miners I said I'm, I'm hoping Antonopoulos writes a book about this I know Cypher Dean has one chapter in the uh, in the fiat standard which is very good I did actually then read read the fiat standard after I'd had this conversation with this person over over messaging um so just for people so your uh the dirty coin uh twitter that you can follow is at dirty coin doc so dirty coin doc and you're at at Alana Media Villa, M E D I A V I L L A. And when is the documentary due out, roughly? What's the the rough date of launch you're going for? And where can people actually watch it when it's live? So we don't have a distribution deal yet, so I don't know exactly where they're going to okay. be able to see it. Um, I'm aiming for a big streaming platform, a mainstream. It's definitely going to be on a mainstream streaming platform. So. Amazon, HBO, Netflix. Um, we'll see which one um, is interested in having the film. Um, but I'm going to be recording until May. So if anybody has watched up to this point, thank you for watching <laughs> the whole thing. Uh, and if they're still watching, I also am still looking for f footage. So if anybody's a home miner or they have any mining footage that they would like to contribute to the film, that would be awesome. And I'm going to be recording until May. And then we lock up recording. Otherwise, I would, you know, continue recording forever because yeah. there's so much to say. And then we're, we've we're already started post with the footage that we have. And then the film is going to be done by the summer. Now, okay. where we premiere is going to depend heavily on which festival uh, allows us, gives us the opportunity to premiere. 
Sundance, if we were to get into Sundance, it's January of next year, but basically it's, it's going to be in one of the, in one of the festivals, at least one of the festivals. And so sometime between that, September and January, I guess, is when you would premiere. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Sometime between September and, and March in case we get into that South by Southwest of 2024. Um, I would like for it to come out now because Ethereum has their documentary um, where they talk about how they've upgraded from proof of work to proof of stake <laughs> um, in December. Upgrade. <laughs> yep, that is exactly the word that they use. Um, so I would love to be able to have Dirty Coin come out before, but also in May, any Bitcoiner that's going to go to the um, to the Bitcoin Miami to the Bitcoin conference, I am going to be hosting a big party for Dirty Coin, and it's going to it's going to have scenes the scenes that are already done. We're going to be presenting those. Oh, nice. Um, I'm going to have a panel of the people that are and Bitcoin Magazine is a supporter of the film as well, so they'll be oh, fantastic. A, They'll be there. Yeah. So definitely in May, there's going to be a really good first look in Miami. So if anybody's going to be there, Krista, if you're going to be there, I would love to I see you. I will be there. Yes, I will be there. Perfect. I will be there with bells on. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Awesome. Awesome. And All thank right. you so much for this opportunity. I mean, I feel like it is people like you that have, that are, that are interested in this, that are giving me the opportunity to either talk to them about the film or, or interview me for the film. I mean, this is, it really makes me feel like ever since I started, even though some people were a little apprehensive because of the name, nobody was ever rude. Um, and it has been such a beautiful community to create in because I would say nine out of 10, 9.9 .9 out of 10 people that I've contacted to, to be in the film have agreed to be in the film or to help or to introduce me to somebody. And it has been a wonderful opportunity. And I would say any creator that is, especially anybody that feels that like they're an outsider, um, if they feel like they they can't create in the community because they are an outsider, I say don't just start yeah. because it is such a welcoming community and everybody has a different angle of how they want to do it. Like um, there's it really is, yeah, it really is, and and I'd say it's it's one of the most intellectually stimulating communities I've ever known. I mean, just the depth and questioning and analysis that people go into. And you know, I sort of joke with this with my husband. I just say, never go up against a Bitcoiner on a topic you don't <laughs> understand well, because they will have researched this to the nth degree and asked every question you can possibly imagine. So I just found for me, it was really like a great intellectual challenge. And it still is just every day, like watching the debates and the discussions. So, yeah, I was actually really hoping on the environment thing. And I don't know if it's going to happen. There seems to be a lot of back and forth. I noticed Cypher Dean and Alex Epstein were sort of having a discussion on Twitter saying that they were maybe just going to do a talk because Cypher Dean wanted to talk to an environmentalist and have a debate. And he's struggling to schedule it with somebody for a variety of reasons. But then Alex was saying, look, I think I know the environmentalist arguments better than actually the environmentalists do, so I'll go on. But I would love to see somebody like Amargo Paz, for example, or Troy Cross or somebody have that discussion. And Troy came out with this very kind of humble sort of response to it, saying he wasn't that familiar with Cypher Dean's work. He'd started reading up on it, but he wanted to read up on it better before having a discussion. And I thought typical Bitcoiner, you know. Because he's, he's one of those Bitcoiners, exactly. Yeah, he wanted to pick the whole thing apart and really understand where he was yes. coming from. So I thought, well, I hope I hope he has time to do that and is able to do that because that's a discussion that I'd love to listen in on. But we'll see. So, yeah, I I was able to interview Troy for the film, and he oh, you did. Is I did. Yeah. I have, I have Troy Margo. I'm going to interview her in May, probably. Amazing. Um, hopefully, hopefully sooner. Um, but he is a very humble man and very smart and yeah. does a ton of research and what he what he brings to the table is what he knows and that's something that I've always appreciated of him is that he understands what he knows and he understands what he doesn't know and he will look up what he doesn't know and I feel exactly the same way and I respect that um because but but he really does follow through on on I'm gonna I'm gonna Next time we speak, I'm going to know about this. And then next time you speak, he will have read about it. And he right. he does what he says he's going to do. And I know there's just so many people with such such high integrity in the space that I I, I really respect and admire. And hopefully they will continue to to put out content. And that's one of those things that you you we also have to they have to be 
they have to be able to pay the bills. And mm. I appreciate things like the Bitcoin Policy Institute and other organizations yes. that that are raising money to be able to give people the time because we do it because we love it. But if we could also get paid to do it, then we would do it more, you know, then because yeah. otherwise we don't have to have that day job. We can our day job can be Bitcoin. And I really appreciate the different institutions that are there to 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 fund these these scientists and these humanitarians and and filmmakers. I should contact them. <laughs> they haven't supported me yet, but that's OK. Um, I love who they are supporting and they're supporting people like Troy Cross yeah. and they're supporting people like Margot Pies and they're and the, they're supporting people that have very, very high integrity. So they're not mm. this isn't a go go and justify Bitcoin for us. This is. Go I was just going to say that as well. It's not a uni, uni kind of party vision, if you like. These are also people that fundamentally disagree, but have done the research. So actually, when you when you, you know, get their kind of position on something and it's very thoughtful and they've you know done all the background to kind of research on it. It's just really interesting to read because you don't just get this sound bite kind of opinion, you know. Exactly, exactly. And they get to debate on that. They get to debate it and they get to see it together. So. You know, there's a great community and I hope that more people can join the community and and just jump in and know that on Twitter, it might seem Bitcoiners might seem more toxic than they really are in real life and or how the community really is. And it's just a matter of whenever I hear somebody say that Bitcoiners are toxic or that, you know, Bitcoin Twitter is toxic, I say maybe start unfollowing some of the people that you follow and follow new people because I've, mm. I haven't encountered that myself. Um, obviously that's not true. Of course I've encountered toxic Twitter, but I, I have more found that people just really want to have a conversation and, yeah. um, but yes, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do a counter argument, you better bring it with your data. This is, this is it. I would say I've, I've seen people get slapped down very publicly. And sometimes I do kind of look at that and I just think, oh, you could have had that conversation bilaterally. It didn't need to be across that whole medium but I do think there's usually a high level of integrity that goes behind it you know it's not like I'm slapping you down because I just want to be an arsehole it's because I actually like think what you're saying is problematic and I need to explain why okay. whether that should or should not be done on a public forum is arguable but yeah I mean I agree with you completely I found it to be one of the most welcoming communities I've I've ever met and most diverse, which is the thing that really blows my mind is you just get people from every single walk of life um I want to say it was I think it, I think it was Larry Lepard made a comment at a recent conference where he said the crazy thing about Bitcoiners is I can meet a Bitcoiner from a completely different walk of life. We would have nothing else in common in a normal context. And I know that I can like I'm going to get along with them and I'm going to have really interesting conversations with them. And I thought that's so true. So true. Anyways, <laughs> I better let you go because we are way over time. But thank you so much again. I'll put all of the details of everything yeah. in the show notes and um yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the film. Thank you. Thank you. And I am, I, you, you know how it was. You, you said, can we meet? And I said, yes. And I gave you a link. So if anybody wants to uh, talk to me more about the film or they have something to say, or they just want to ask me more questions about anything, I am here and I'm not, I'm still not too busy that I can't take strangers meetings. <laughs> so not too busy and not too famous yet. <laughs> not too busy, not too famous. So please uh, just reach out because I'm, I'm very passionate about this and I enjoy learning. Um, and so thank you so much, Krista, for the opportunity. Thank you. Oh, so great chatting. Thank you. Thank you.